Hey everyone, Super Magical Cup, Rum Ham, and I'm Rainy. Today we're going to be talking about the timeline, the meta mm. timeline for Clash Royale. This is a new series I'm really excited to start here, exclusively on YouTube, where we, uh, Rainy and myself, along with some future uh, guest hosts, are going to be talking about not the meta today, but the meta that was. We're going to go back all the way to the launching of Clash Royale, the yes. turn of the year, and talk about each balance update and how it changed the game up to the present time. Back to the prehistoric stages. And so, mm -hmm. as I can recall, the game launches January 4th. From him. Yes, and, and you were there day one. You I was were there, just waiting to get your hands on the game. What was it like? What was that world like? Yeah, I was a huge uh, Supercell fan. I had played Clash of Clans and Boom Beach, and I'd played the game before uh, Clash Royale called Smashland that was released oh, into wow. Canada, but never actually made a global huh. launch. Most of the Smashland team had moved on to Clash Royale, so when I heard that that team had a new game out, I was like, oh. <laughs> I gotta try it, right? So I downloaded it from game day one and almost immediately uh, fell in love with it. I remember day one there was no information, right? Like there wasn't Clash wikis, there wasn't all this great info out there. So we were in this position of like just figuring out the games. I remember playing going, oh, you know what would be cool? I bet you could put buildings down in this game. I bet, you, I bet you could put buildings down that would defend your towers. And then of course you, you unlock cannon, you're like, oh cool. You're, uh, I remember unlocking Goblin Hut, and that was the first card that I fell in love with, being like, oh, it's a wow. building that spawns troops? What else is this game gonna come up with? And uh, that, was, that was really awesome. So what would you say, when you first started getting into the game and getting to play it and experiencing it, for you, Goblin Hut was a really nice card. Mm -hmm. You kind of really liked that, but what did you see as kind of the best cards in the game, the most yeah. effective at the time? Well, it's interesting because it's a very small number of people. It was only released into Canada, Australia, a few other countries right, right away. So, and of, you know, of those small people, most people weren't really like buying gems or anything. So everyone's impression of the whole meta was really based on like arenas one, two, and three cards because it didn't really have a lot of yeah. that. And if you think about how when you start out, your epics are higher level than your commons and rares yeah. at first. All of the early discussion was about the epic cards being broken. Like, yeah. people thought Prince was super broken, um, Witch was really broken, mm -hmm. uh, Skeleton Army not so much. I remember even then Skeleton Army was not considered a very strong card, but like Baby Dragon and Prince were like, who's gonna do something about these cards? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, which was really interesting. Um, I remember cards like Goblin Barrel being really strong because uh -huh. players just didn't have familiarity with the game mechanics yet, didn't really know how yeah. to counter it. Things like arrowing your own tower isn't very yeah. intuitive, so people just like didn't know what to do about Goblin Barrel and just felt like it was this incredibly yeah. powerful card. Yeah, incredibly, incredibly interesting. And when you first start the game, you get your own few epics. Which mm -hmm. ones were the ones that you got? I started off with... I want to say Baby Dragon. I think I Baby opened Dragon. Baby Dragon right off the bat, and I remember playing it a ton. If you actually look, my initial Reddit post, the first Reddit deck I ever posted, was this, like, nonsense hodgepodge of cards, right? But it was, like, Baby Dragon, Expo, Rocket. I remember those three cards were in it, and I was like, guys, this deck is crazy. Like, <laughs> this is awesome. I'm yeah. the best. Yeah. Um, so what would you say then? So we've talked a little bit about, you know, the epics were really mm -hmm. a strong card. Goblin, Goblin Barrel, Prince, Baby Dragon. Then on the flip side, what would you say was really lacking at this time? Uh, it was weird because we didn't know this at the time, but I, I, we found it out later from talking to developers and stuff. Apparently late in beta, buildings didn't have um, lifespans. They lasted forever. They just last, <laughs> lasted until you destroyed it. So coming right out into this early beta launch, all the buildings were really like overcosted. Not not all of them, but a lot of them were really overcosted because they had just gotten a lifespan added to them, mm -hmm. but they hadn't like rebalanced them around right. that. So cannon cost six elixir. Oh my! And was God. like the worst card in the game. Nobody played cannon. Like not a single oh person. It's God. actually cannon had cost six elixir. And had like the same DPS that it does today. Like still, <laughs> like to, like it, I don't know how much Cannon's DPS has ever been nerfed from the time of the game launched until when you're watching this video. But its DPS was like the same for six months, right? Like, yeah. but it cost yeah. twice as much. Uh, and you'll see, I guess, if you follow the series and we go through the patch notes, you'll see how these cards evolved over time. Other cards like Mortar mm. will cost six elixir. Or it was yeah. huge. Like there was it's another expo in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. Um, I definitely remember very popular cards today not being played very much at all. Like Valkyrie was popular in that first like week of launch because again it's early Arena One, yeah. Arena Two, but it was significantly lower hit points and damage than it would be later in the game's lifespan. Mm -hmm. And like it wasn't 
yeah. really played once you got out of Arena 2 or so. Musketeer cost 5 Elixir and had oh less God. DPS than it would later have. So Wizard was super popular. I remember Wizard was like the best card in the game and nobody played Musketeer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, it was very interesting. It was definitely a period of discovery. People didn't know what was good yet and so mm -hmm. few people were even in like Arena 5 and Arena 6, that it was hard to make judgment calls on those cards. Like, Golem was a really good card, yeah. but so few people knew because Arena 6 was the highest arena. Right. Uh, that only went up to 1,700 trophies. There was no arenas beyond 1,700 <laughs> trophies. And it was Arena 6, which was Royal Arena, was 1,700. Right. Builder's Arena came later. Right. They, they added in arenas in between. Yeah. So, what do you feel like, and of course, the player base in general, as the game kind of lasts longer and longer the player base learns and grows yeah. with the game how are people kind of playing the game if you could recall were people kind of figuring out play styles that they were comfortable with i mean i think as the game grows more advanced strategies sure. i mean you mentioned goblin barrel for example were people really into like throwing spells or were they just kind of trying yeah. to put together big pushes a key thing to remember then was that spells did more damage to crown towers than they do later on there was a big nerf to spell damage to crown towers. So cards like Fireball and Rocket were really popular. Um, Zap was not popular because Zap didn't have the stun effect at the time. Mm -hmm. So Arrows was played in like every deck. Like I think you'll even see in the some of these later patch notes as we go through the series, there's one part where they say Arrows is the most played card in the game. And yeah. it really felt like that. I mean, every yeah. deck played Arrows because everyone had access to minions. Mm -hmm. Barbs aren't really an arable thing, but you know, minions, goblins, goblin barrel, mm -hmm. those sort of things were very popular, so everyone just sort of felt like you mm -hmm. had to run arrows, and Zap didn't have the combat prowess that it has right. now with the stun effect. Fireball and Rocket were really popular because, and Lightning too, mm -hmm. because they did so much damage to towers that it was even that much easier to sort of just rocket spam people. Mm -hmm. And with buildings, not all buildings, but some buildings we'll see as we go through the patch notes later, were really, really good. Like, way better than they are later on in the life cycle. So a common strategy, even from the early days of the game, were to throw up a bunch of defensive towers and then just rocket and fireball your mm -hmm. opponent to death. Which was not Basically, very Basically, cycling spells. Yeah, cycling, cycling spells, spells was, was a big deal. So, of course, a duration after the game launches, they come out with their first ever balance patch. Mm -hmm. This was about a week after launch, too. So this was very... It was knee-jerky, both from Supercell's standpoint and really from right. the community standpoint. The community didn't really know what a balance game looked like yet. Yeah. Supercell, I think, just wanted to make sure that they were quelling kind of some early... Uh, concerns. Early concerns, yeah. yeah, on the game. Yeah. So, I mean, we have that change up here on Let's screen. Let's them. So we can go ahead and take a look at, and you mentioned the epics, especially because everybody was so low level, yes. and even if you make a new account, new account now, today, it still holds true, right? Yes. The epics are still incredibly overleveled compared to, to the rest of your yeah. card levels. A level one epic is equivalent to a level six common. So it takes you a few days to get your commons up to level six, so in that early time, you have basically a level six common in your level one prince, mm -hmm. and then a bunch of cards that just aren't as strong in terms of the health and damage balancing mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. So they and all also felt really strong. The, and also in the defense too, right? Because yes. as, as they push across, the towers are also leveled. So the towers mm -hmm. just in general do less damage to those epics. Correct, yeah. So I remember the first one, the prince health decreased by 4%. This was the original LOL Supercell 4% nerf. And you'll see it as we go through these balance updates. There's a couple of these. These are what game developers call suggestive buffs and nerfs. They don't necessarily change huge amounts of what the card actually does, but it's a little nudge of like, hey, if you like this card, maybe go try out a different card instead. <laughs> yeah. So they decreased the health of the prince by 4%, which I ended up only being, I think, maybe one tower shot, if even one tower yeah. shot, with the idea being that those really low health princes would die just before they hit the tower instead of mm -hmm. clunking into the tower. Right, because the double damage is, is actually a huge. big difference. Right. So right off the bat, prince... A little suggestive nerf, as you would no say. No haircut. And then the Goblin Barrel also takes... This is a pretty significant nerf, actually. So this is an interesting change about how the game... How the card levels worked in the game, you know, before and after things changed. So, uh... In the game first launch, epics were considered... Like, commons were f five levels higher than an epic. So we just talked about how a level one epic is a level six... Yeah. Uh, common. Yeah. Now, apparently Supercell had that philosophy early on, but the max card levels were not the same at launch. At launch, epics could go to level 8, which is still true. Yeah. Rares could go to level 10, 
and commons could go to level 12. Yeah. Later on in the game's life cycle, they added level 11 rares and level 13 commons. Mm -hmm. But there was a period in time where like, max level epics were better than max level commons. Right. And you see that very early on. So Goblin Barrel used to make plus five level goblins, which made plus five level skeletons. In this nerf, they pulled them back to plus four to mimic the eight, eight to 12 ratio. Right. So it's like, okay, level eight, which will make level 12 skeletons when it used to make level 13 skeletons. Right. They later on revert this many, you know, many patches yeah. in the future, but it was crazy because imagine early on that these epics, if you had the max level, Goblin Barrel was making level 13 goblins yeah. when level 13 goblins didn't exist in the game. Right. Same thing with Witch. Right. So bringing them down and kind of bringing it more in line with the max level gameplay. And this also aligns with the people thought epics were really powerful, right? Yeah. If you had a level one Goblin Barrel, it was making level six goblins in a world where you might not even have level six goblins at mm. that point. Right, right. And it seemed really strong. So then moving straight on ahead, the first of many, many interactions with the Mortar. Absolutely. The one thing I do want to say, the last note I'll make on the Goblin Barrel Witch was funny is that they nerfed Goblin Barrel and Witch here in this very first patch. After that, Goblin Barrel and Witch become some of the worst cards in the game for several balance updates. It was yeah. not... Like, oh, they were still good after that. You're going to see as we go through the series, which gets buffed again and again and again and again after this initial kind of weaky nerf. So yeah. when we were saying that it was a very knee-jerky patch, I almost wonder if Supercell could have maybe left Witch alone and let the meta sort itself out. Mm -hmm. Not that the skeleton level, I think, was the end of the world. I think that card would have mm -hmm. needed some buffs anyways. But And, and I think what we're going to see is as the, as the game grows older, that point that I was mentioning about the player base gets better and, and yes. gameplay gets more defined, I think that really brings out a lot of why these changes happened the way they did and why the game played out the way they, that they did. Right. So, so the Mortar, lifetime so, decreased to 40 seconds. And now, you in context, yeah, so in context, Mortar at the time cost six elixir and lasted for, I think, 50 or 60 seconds. And it was supposed to be like a common version of the Expo, but what does they mention here, the total damage of an unanswered Mortar was more than an Expo. <laughs> so I think that they had to just separate, like, what is the point of these two cards? Why do we have two cards that are identical? And I think they wanted to try to set it up. You'll see in the future, they rework Mortar down to four Elixir, but I think this was the first sort of just um, haircut to the card. I mean, even then, commons were easier to request, etc. Right. So I don't think they wanted a common card that you could over-level that was better than an already problematic Expo card. One thing we haven't really talked about is that Expo was one of the best cards in the game at launch. You're going to see over the next few patches, it was nerfed three, four times yeah. in a row. It was yeah. such an overpowered card at launch that I think that they were like, all right, we're going to deal with Expo, but in the meantime, we don't want a common Expo that's arguably better because it does more damage over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So very interesting. And, and some of these balance changes will start giving you a look into kind of how Supercell's philosophy on how the game should be run changes over time yeah. and also just slight changes in kind of decisions that they make, you know, sometimes they try something and they don't like how it works and so they'll, they'll do something in another direction. So super interesting. And these last two changes are kind of less to do with the units themselves and yeah. more to do with kind of the game. The experience the of Clash right. Royale. Right. So I do remember this, that there was a period in like, okay, so getting from level eight to nine was a little easier than it is now. And I remember a lot of people zipped to nine. Early on in the first, I swear to God, like the first week of the game, you could be player level seven, eight, nine, and be in the top 200. Like the leaderboards, there were <laughs> no ma that. there was no day one max players that I remember. So there were people who like very early on were just, oh, I'm like one of the best players in the game. I'm level six. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's very funny. Uh, and then the other one was kind of interesting. The very first version of TV Royale would put out two replays every hour. But if you looked at the list, it would look like one had a ton of views and the next one would not have a lot of views, mm -hmm. a ton of views, a few views, et cetera. And it's because they're putting two at a time. Right. People would watch the top one, but then maybe not scroll down the list. Mm -hmm. So they, they just reduced it to one per hour. Very yeah. minor change, although it would be kind of cool to see one every half hour yeah. or so. Yeah. But uh, this was just a very one of the early minor changes. You can see that even very professional companies like Supercell sometimes aren't sure about the very details of their, yeah. their game. And, and even more so, TV Royale is something that they, they constantly look at, and they'll be making bigger changes in of the course. future, too. Absolutely. Yeah. So, overall, after this balance patch happened, so we're, we were at release, and then the balance patch occurred, how did the game change at that point? And I'm sure that most, a lot of these changes came from the balance patch, but a lot of it must have come from players kind of figuring new things out. Other than 
Like, again, I remember Goblin Barrel and Witch becoming very terrible after this, but I think they were already kind of bad, and people just sort of figured it out. There's not another balance patch to this game for about three weeks to a month, and I think during that time, people were just really figuring out the game. I remember Expo became solidified as, like, one of the best cards in the game. Prince was still very strong, but I think as the players started to learn about cards like Skeletons, Goblins, Distracting, and things like that, mm -hmm. it naturally saw less play as people started to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, cards like Hog Rider that we think of now as very much like a staple of competitive play were not very good or very popular at the time mm -hmm. because of the strength of, of buildings. Mm -hmm. So I definitely remember it being very siege-based. It was Expo certainly was the dominant card. Uh, rocket Cycling and things like that were also very strong. But in terms of what you played on the ladder, it was still a lot of giant decks, prince decks, because even though those cards might have been the best if you're trying to win, people were just trying to ladder and explore the game and try out their new cards. And there wasn't any sort of structured tournament system to really yeah. prove out which decks were the best. Yeah. But I definitely remember the community brigade was against Expo. <laughs> Expo for sure. Siege has a large part in, in Clash Royale's history. These first few videos are going to be talking a lot about Siege decks for sure. But thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and want to hear more, tell us down in the YouTube comments what you'd like us to talk more about, what you'd like to hear more about, or your thoughts on the very first few weeks of uh, Clash Royale's lifetime. Make sure to subscribe below and tune in for the next video in the series. See you guys.